Hi, this is Claudia Filos with the Center for Linux Studies, and I'm so delighted to be joined here today by Professor Leonard Milner and some members of our community. Uh, thank you all for joining us. Thanks for asking. So Lenny, um, can you start us off by helping us think about um, a question that's come up in our community, which is about the Homeric question. Or sometimes we might hear in our project or on some CHS writings by Gregory Knowledge, um, Homeric questions. Can you explain to us what, what the Homeric question is, what Homeric questions are, okay. and um, yeah, and, and why, why that's something we might want to think about? Okay, so, uh, so it's a really beautiful subject, and I think this, the notion of question, and I think it's addressed in Gregory Knowledge's book, which has the word in the plural, Homeric questions. But the, the Latin word quaestio, which comes, by the way, from the verb quaeso, which means to search for things, okay? It doesn't mean to ask questions, it means just to do research, <laughs> okay? So it's a, it, it me, so a quaestio in Latin means a, 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 sub, a topic of research, is a, a Latin translation of the word that the Aristotelian school used, problema, and there's a collection of, of uh, Aristotelian problemata, which are basically questions that, that, that Aristotle uh, tr tried to answer, or quest you know, questions about literary phenomena, and as well as other things, okay? A very interesting set of uh, things. And um, so it means, it, I think the best way to think of it is uh, the Homeric question is a topic of discussion, and, and it's important not to uh, not to take what I'm saying. I may give you a one kind of answer to this question. It's a highly, it, it, it's, it's tricky to give answers to something that's a research topic. So I think we want to conceive of it in the way in which scholarship really works, which is I give you my answer and then the next person comes along and gives a better one, okay? We're all standing on the shoulders of the people who came before us, and they will people will stand on our shoulders to see things more clearly. So it's an ongoing process of research rather than trying to provide definitive answers. Okay, and and I don't want you to think of this or what I would say as an answer as being a party line or the definitive answer. I think we should undertake this to discuss this whole topic in that form and in that way. So I think we have better answers to this problem, okay? And the problem in the classic form, the Homeric question is singular. The Hi Sarah, the, the standard form uh, of it is how and uh, how did the Homeric poems get composed or created uh, in the f and uh, reach the form that they have? So it's questions about what we would call authorship as well as uh, uh, as well as transmission, okay. Okay. Uh, all right. And when you implore it, um, use this word in the plural, um, it no longer means it, it, it's a more uh, the difference between question a particular question and questions is a difference between something more abstract and something more concrete. This is a standard thing in English and in other languages. When you say liberty, it means an abstraction, but liberties are concrete things. So there are a whole series of questions that you could uh, you could break down the Homeric question into. And, um, and I think Gregory Nager's book does a stellar job of answering a whole bunch of questions that you may have after hearing what I say and sort of deals with standard misunderstandings as well as understandings of what this answer is, okay? Um, sure. I, so I recommend to people to look at that as well as to listen to what I, I might want to say about this subject, okay? Okay, yeah, so we have other places we can turn and it's an ongoing yep. dialogue. Exactly, this is about an inquiry, okay? It's about trying to figure stuff out, okay? Great. All right, yep, okay. So, so that's helpful. So then, so if that's sort of our overall approach to creating a dialogue, then can you help us think about when you say, you know, some of the questions are about authorship and transmission. So yes. how do we think about authorship within yeah. this context of, let's say, the Homeric epics? Okay, so so the, 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 the state of understanding that, that I can convey about this problem is based on the work of Milman Parry and Albert Lord, okay? Mm -hmm. And it's, a, it's based on, on two things, on an internal 
investigation. That was the starting point, was an internal investigation of the way Homeric language works. And then it, it turned into a comparative uh, um, uh, uh, research project. But let's talk about mm -hmm. the internal one first, because I think that's really important and easy to misunderstand. So the work is, this is Milman Parry, who wrote a doctoral thesis in the 1920s in Paris under the supervision of Antoine Meillet, who is a historical linguist of Indo-European languages. He wrote uh, historical grammars of, of a whole bunch of of the Indo-European languages. And, and uh, he, he already, um, before the work of Parry, uh, published the idea that all the, the language in the Homeric epics, in the Iliad and the Odyssey, uh, and the Homeric hymns, I think that, that was his corpus, uh, all the language in them was formulaic. Okay, he didn't define what he meant at that time. Uh, okay, because I was no, just gonna ask, yes, what does that mean? He, he, he didn't define what it meant, but he, it, it's, in other words, there's a, although it's been denied, there's an intimate relationship between the work. This is in a work that Maye wrote on the origin of the meters of, of Greek lyric poetry mm -hmm. in Indo-European, uh, in, in the Indo-European context, in which he showed that there's a, a genetic uh, historical relationship between the meters of, say, the, rig, the hymns of the Rig Veda in Sanskrit and the, and the poetry of Sappho, okay? Uh, the way the meter works, not the rules of prosody, as well as the forms of the meters. This is an extraordinary thing in the 1920s. So, so they go back. This makes sense if you understand uh, poetic diction in the way that I hope we can. I can give you an inkling of uh, now. So, what he what he get asked uh, his graduate student Milman Parry to do and what Milner Parry chose to work on, I'm not sure where the topic itself started, was to work on the so-called traditional epithets in, in Homeric poetry. And, and Parry did this work, his thesis, which was published in, I always get the date wrong, I think it's 29, but I'm not sure, maybe, maybe a different one. But anyhow, it's in that neighborhood. Um, the, the, uh, what he did was something very simple, which is basically to study the way that names and the epithets work in Homeric poetry. So we all know these things, even if you not only know the poem in translation, these are things like swift-footed Achilles, uh, white-armed goddess Hera, uh, uh, cloud-gathering Zeus, all these major characters, and some of the minor ones have these funny adjectives. Many of them are compound adjectives like swift-footed, consisting of two elements. Um, and they, they seem to be stuck onto the names of particular people. There are two kinds. There are those that are specific to individuals or an individual and a few others or just an individual. And then there are those that are more generic. Okay, So any hero can be, the Greek word is dios. It's often translated uh, godlike, but it really probably means radiant or shiny. Okay. Anyhow, um, these are these are there are generic ones and specific ones. What what Milman Perry did was to take the all the major heroes and gods, and look at the epithet noun combinations that they have, the epithet name combinations that they have. These combinations occur at the ends of the poetic line. The Homeric poetic line is very complex and intricate, but at the end it's more fixed. And this is a feature of inter-European metrics that, that as, as Maye described them, that you have fluidity at the beginning of the line and then fixity at the end. So the challenge in the harder part of composition is to get the end meter correct because it's more tricky and more less less fluid okay so at the end of the line you had to have a concentration of these name epithet combinations and and greek is a language that has in which the forms of nouns change depending on their grammatical functions so if a noun is a subject of a sentence it's uh, for example the name of achilles is achilleos if it's the direct object of a sentence, then it changes to achillea, which is metrically different, has another syllable and different form. But anyhow, for if you just look at, say, the nominative forms that where, the, where these names, these heroes or gods are subjects, you'll have a set for any given major hero or god, you'll have a set of three or, or four of these combinations. You'll have a simple one like radiant Achilles, dios Achilles. You'll have a, 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 another one which is swift-footed godlike Achilles, uh, Podarches dios Achilles, or you'll have 
uh, Podas, Ocus, Echilos. All those three combinations have different metrical, uh, uh, are, are totally different metrically. There is no overlap between them. Okay, and so what he sh what he did was to he, he looked at this huge number of these things for gods and heroes, and he showed that for all of the major characters you have a set like that for each of them. Okay, and and uh, and there there there's very little there's almost no overlap. There are very few cases where you have two name epithet combinations in the same case that are grammatically the same. There are cases like uh, for Hector, there are two ways in which you can put his name, two simple ways in which you can put his name at the end of the line. You can say, Abrimos Hector, which is dum da da dum bum, shave and a haircut at the end of the line. Or you can say, Fidemos Hector, which is the same rhythm, but one begins with a consonant, the phi, and the other begins with a vowel. That means they work in metrically different neighborhoods, okay? So those are not redundant uh, features. You can see that, and there are a bunch of them like that. There's all, you can do dios achilos, which begins with a D, or you can do okus achilos, swift Achilles, right? That's the same kind of phenomenon. So what, what Parry showed was that these are uh, constitute a system. Okay, and they weren't created by. Here was his con, con, here was his conclusion that these uh, uh, this system of noun epithet combinations for the gods and heroes, which are economical and extend an extended system. Okay, were not the creation of an individual. There wasn't a Greek in the Bronze Age and the Dark Ages sitting down with index cards trying to figure out what their different combinations were. Okay, what he concluded was that they were the product of a, they were a linguistic phenomenon, the product of an over, uh, of a tradition developing over a long period of time, and not the creation of an individual. Okay, um, so, so that's what the name of his thesis was, l'epithet traditionnel, uh, the traditional epithet, and he meant that in a very profound way. Okay, so this is the major conclusion was that that this part of the language is a system, that's very important, okay, because it's systematic and, and economical, uh, and that it's, it's not a, an individual author's creation. This is a, a very interesting and provocative finding, okay, and, it's, and he also did more things, okay, but I think this is the essential uh, contribution. And at his thesis defense, Maye, his thesis director, invited a a person who had been working in the mountains of what was then called the Yugoslavia, um, which is uh, parts of what we now call Bosnia, Herzegovina, Serbia, and other places, um, where and, and he was recording songs by people who didn't know how to read and write, but who could compose songs. Um, um, and, he, and he said, there, here we have a tradition that should be comparable to what you what you and explain the phenomenon that you found in the Homeric um, poems. So Perry and 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 his young student Albert Lord, um, who who survived him, um, uh, got together funding. He became a, a, a assistant professor at Harvard after getting his degree at the Sorbonne. And he got together funding to do this research in the mountains of Yugoslavia. And they went up there with a, with a, a very big instrument that had two turntables and produced aluminum discs. And they made recordings of people who, as I just described it, they could compose and perform at the same time. And, and they, they talked to these people. There were interviews. They learned the language a bit. They had a native a speaker who interviewed the singers and sometimes parry, parry uh, uh, to ask them questions. They, they kind of did it. Uh, they called it a kind of living laboratory, a place in which they could experiment with the way poetry works in such a context. And so here we had a, a system in which what you're doing, the essential notion, as Albert Lord described it, is that they're performing and composing at the same time, okay? That's the essential thing. It doesn't have anything necessarily to do with reading and writing, but the fact that these people were illiterate means that the writing was not a, an essential part in any way of the process, okay? Um, that, that's been proven uh, since, okay? You can, whether you have writing or not, you can have a compositional process that's based on a systematization of language, 
into a poetic language and that functions in this way. So for example, you can take a person who learn how to sing in this way and the way it works and the, they studied the way singers were formed in, in these traditions. That you start as a young boy imitating and learning from a person who's older, okay? And basically what you learn is a form of your language that's highly stylized and poetic and made for expressing and telling stories, okay? In this poetic way. So you learn the meter and the language and the stories all together, and you keep on practicing and practicing. You do your your twenty or thirty thousand or forty thousand hours of of apprenticeship. Okay, all right. Want me, want to stop for a second? I'll be glad to. Yeah, you 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 yeah. triggered me here. No, <laughs> no, no, it's questions. so good. It's yeah. so good. But you know, I'm noticing a little technical glitch. I think is okay. when um, if we don't go back and forth, I think that's when your video gets a little bit behind. Okay. Okay. I'm going to edit out this conversation. So I think if we can, like, so if you take little pauses. Okay. So right now you're a little bit more in sync than you were a minute ago. Are other people noticing that too, guys? No. <laughs> no. Okay. So it's just on my end that you're out of sync. Okay. Well, that's fine. Well, it's, okay. it's all right. I'll be glad to stop. And, 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 no, uh, no, no. So I just wanted that little pause. So we can get okay. the video to catch up. Okay, great. So okay. I think that's a great place. Um, One thing you just might clarify, Lenny. Sure. Um, you know, earlier you had mentioned that, um, actually, you know what, I'm just going to start this question over because I'm going to do a little cut there, okay? Okay, all right. Um, so let me have a question for you. A moment ago, um, when you were just talking about composition and performance, um, right. that was an important concept for us to think about. Uh, right. And a little, a minute before that, a minute or two before that, you mentioned the idea that sort of the end of the line was trickier than the beginning of the line. So yes. is that because, now is that because the, the person is trying to fit things into meter and it's hard to do that? So is the meter an obstacle? Is that what you're saying? No, I think that, that is, this is a seem to be a tendency in all in the metrical systems of all the Indo-European languages. In some in, in some Sanskrit meters, the quantity of the syllables, and that I use that word advisedly, but let's not get into the details, but whether a syllable is stressed or unstressed or long or short, I'm not married to any of those things. Whether a syllable is stressed or unstressed or long or short doesn't matter at the beginning of a line, but it becomes, there's a fixed pattern at the end. So there's a kind of teleology to the line, and yet it's a way of creating an end, okay, as opposed to the beginning, right? You When mm -hmm. you get to the pattern at the end, which becomes more and more fixed, and then the other thing that happens is that the fixation seems to grow from the end of the line towards the beginning. So it gets more and more, they have more fluidity and then the, the, the fixity that you have at the end starts to expand to the left and into the beginning. That seems to be the evolutionary process in the way meters worked in Indo-European languages. So it's not that it's an obstacle, it's just an evolutionary process. And it has to do with the idea that uh, this is a way you express the boundedness of the line, I think. These are lines, all the lines in Greek poetry, uh, in Homeric poetry anyway, are end stopped in the mm -hmm. sense that you come to an end and then you start a new line. And there usually is a grammatical thing as well as a pause. I think you can assume there's a pause. So mm -hmm. so it, in, in some traditions, like the Yugoslav tradition, there's a certain number of syllables in the line okay, as well as a rhythmical pattern. And that's true of the Sanskrit tradition too. In, in the Greek poetry, it's about a rhythmical pattern and less about, uh, in Homeric poetry, and less about syllable counting. In Sappho, it's still a matter of syllables, okay, for example. Okay. So, so, and so the, are, but the idea is yeah. that, the, that these systems actually facilitate the, the composition that's of right. poetry. That's they're, they're right. Part, they're a part and parcel of what makes poetry, okay, that you have this stylization of the rhythm of natural language, okay? I think that's the way to think of it, all right? Um, Great. Um, and so, as, so I think we're starting to get a sense of authorship, uh, as uh -huh. you were talking about before. Yes. Uh, and about how uh, maybe a, we're starting to get a sense about transmission as we think about composition and performance. Right, um, right. So I guess I'm wondering next about what does all this mean for us as readers of the Iliad and the Odyssey? Okay. So if you if you think about this as a system that you that you you learn this the way you learn your own language, except this is the language for composing and performing poetry. Okay. If you think of it in those terms, then that our notion of author as an individual genius, okay, genius is a part of this discussion, okay, um, 
this is a, this this language of genius as an individual author who can write and does something that's extraordinary. Uh, it doesn't you can't apply that to a system like the Yugoslav poetry, and it's difficult to do it already from Bill and Parry's internal research. Okay, uh, because the language is not uh, is not something that particular. Uh, poem or poet can be creating. Okay, is using language that is a system that's uh, that's designed to create to generate the poetry in the same way as we generate speech when we converse or to give a talk or something. Okay, so if we think in these terms, then then it's the tradition in a way that's the author of the poem, and the individual is a transmitter of the of the tradition and maybe there are better and worse transmitters okay and the singers are there there are the difference in the quality of singers that the parry and lord found okay that's not to say that uh, that every one of them is perfect but they're all trying their best to transmit their tradition to the to their audiences uh, which are which is an interactive process too, because the, in a sense, I think the best way to think of the audience in a tradition like this is that they're passive performers. They know the tradition. They've been hearing it for years and years themselves. And what they, what happens then is that that, that accelerates or, or, or um, accentuates the importance of the quality of the, of the performance, right? You want to have a good performance. You want to have something that, that, that makes the that realizes the tradition in the most powerful and expressive way. It's not the newness of the story or its unexpected turns or a different use of language. It's how well you use the language, okay, and the tradition to express uh, the inherent beauty and the power of the stories, right, and the characters and so forth. So, so those things are 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 things that get optimized in a system like this. I think it's important to think of it. Some people think because these people couldn't read and write, they produced crap, okay? And it's an inferior form of literature. But it, it, it's the opposite that happens. This is a, a system for perfection and perfecting uh, what's what's told. That's extraordinary, really. So we shouldn't underestimate the, the aesthetic possibility of a system like this, even is so different from our own, okay? Um, all right, so so what happens then when we're reading this kind of poetry? What difference does this make? A lot of people say, well, it doesn't really matter, because we are, our poets work in a tradition too, okay? But it's not a tradition in which the language is given to them as such, right? The language is a, is a generative, as a, for, a, a form of uh, poetic language is generated in the same way as speech is generated, okay? Uh, there are certain, obviously, certain people in our culture who are, who are gifted in this use of language. And that's where the romantic idea of the great genius poet comes in. It's, it's a relatively new idea in the history of the world. The poet is an exceptional person, okay? And, and, uh, but, but what happens, I think, then, is that you want to think of the poetry as being, uh, as being something that, whose traditionality needs to be understood. What you need to do in order to be become the best possible reader, because where readers are no longer listening to performances of Homeric poetry, which, you know, were performed for generations into, into the modern period, into the second century CE in, in the Greek world. Um, we're no longer listening to performances where we're readers. And the, the, the simplest manifestation of this is the conventionality of Homeric poetry, okay? There's the conventionality in the language. There's also conventionality in larger units, like in themes, like when a hero puts on his armor or when a sacrifice is performed, or, or uh, when you have a description of a battle. So there are standard ways of doing these things, but they're also varied in very interesting ways that are very expressive. If you don't understand the tradition, you lose the subtlety and the, and the expressiveness that comes from the traditionality of the language. So everyone may know the standard way for a hero to be armed, but then there are individual ways in which individual heroes get their armor on, and the way in which it's described that may be very expressive about their characters as a hero, and the way in which they are being portrayed, it becomes symbolic of them as persons, okay, as an expressive of them. Or, or, for example, the way you make a prayer, okay, so there's a standard format for a prayer, uh, which features the invocation of a god, usually an expression of something you've done that that 
that attests to your relationship to the divinity, and your, it's a reciprocal relationship that you have. You do things for the god, therefore the god or the goddess does things for you, and then you make a request, okay? So, for example, that's a standard form, but when Telemachus makes a prayer, he, 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 uh, he, for example, to Athena, he doesn't know who the goddess was, and she says, oh, goddess who came to me yesterday, okay? And then, and then he, he leaves out the request. He's so helpless that he doesn't know what to ask for, okay? So you have standard, substandard forms. You can also have more elaborated forms, okay? So understanding, getting the hang of what are, what are the possible variations on a way in which something can be told in the epic is a way to start to understand the nuances of any particular passage and the expressiveness of it. This is a, a really important way. If we think of the author of the poem, it's not, it's not about the message, a messenger rather, it's not about the author, which is what the way we're used to thinking of reading. We're communicating, say, with Shakespeare and what he thought, but it's about the message, okay? And we want to, if you want to understand the message, you've got to think about the traditionality of this message and all of its possible variations. If you lose that, if you don't have that, and if you only read the, the epic once, you're, you're just getting the surface, okay? I love that. I love that. And, and so that really gets to the core about why in our community we do encourage people to, to read it more than once, to yes. participate in, let's say, a learning project more than once, where you read it more than once. Exactly. That, that's so beautiful, Denny. So at this point, I want to just open it up to, um, to our community members here. I invite them to introduce themselves uh, before they comment or share a question. Um, Please. You know. So guys. Okay, we've got a question here. So Janet, Janet, okay. you don't want to ask your question? <laughs> oh, you're killing me. Uh, all right, so I'm going to ask for Janet. So Janet okay. um, is joining us from New York, and she's asking, coming from the so-called genius view, how right. do they explain variations, um, and how epics, how did they um, not change at all in transmission? Um, okay, so Janet, unfortunately, is having some noise in the background, so that's fine, Janet. Thank you so much for coming. I'm sorry, it's such a... Uh, a difficult transmission for you. Okay. So, so, uh, uh, can you, let me see if I can see this. Oh, okay. Hold on. Yeah, so, Lenny, if you take your cursor over to the left yep, and that, click on I've the blue it, chat bar. I've got it, yep. Trying to make it appear, but it doesn't seem to be. Shoot. Uh, chat. That's okay, because right. we're going to edit out right. any fumbling, okay? All right, so there's yeah. no stress. But it's, it's just not... It's not showing up. Oh, there okay. it is. Okay, here. You see it, the blue okay. chat? One? Okay, now I've got it. I was looking in the wrong place. Coming from the so-called genius view, how do they, how do they explain variations and how epics did not change at all in transmission? Um, I'm a, I'm a little confused about the question, um, so we could be good to answer. But if you does she mean by they people who have the genius view? Right. Oh, yeah. I think okay. is that what you're saying, Janice? Okay. people who might yes. say that there was maybe one individual who either a Mr. Homer or uh -huh. maybe an individual, maybe not named Homer, who had an outsized influence right. on the creation, right. or maybe the collection. That's another thing that um, some people talk about. Well, there wasn't a Homer who wrote the Iliad and Nazi, but there was a Homer who collected all the stories together. Sure. So, so. Um, yeah, because there are examples, comparatively speaking, of epic traditions that were collected and then edited into a into something like a whole. Um, but but um, let's let's talk about this. So there is we ha we have attested from antiquity um, variants um, uh, in the in the wording of the epics. Okay, in other words, in the words used in individual lines, and then we have information. Of different editions that included and did not or did not include certain parts of the epic. Okay, so for example, there was a version of the an ed edition of the Iliad in the Alexandrian in the pre-Alexandrian or the Alexandrian period that didn't have the shield of Achilles in it. Okay. Wow. Wow. So those are big, big things, big differences in terms of the way things work. But um, but so it's everything like that and in between. And these are these these variations are what you expect from a traditional performance system, okay? Because the, 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 the text is a, is a, an, the composition of the text is an ongoing process. So if you have uh, the spread of a, of a tradition over a wide area and you have different people performing it, there's going to be differentiation, 
okay? And when Parry and Lord did their examples, they, they would, for example, ask a singer to sing a song and then a couple of years later do it again. And the singer would say, oh, I'll do it the same word for word and line for line. And they didn't really know what words and lines were. Okay, but there would be differences. There would be differences in the in the structure of the poetry as well as in the wording of it. Okay, although the general the general in general the song seems to be the same. So so you can understand that if you don't have the, the combination of verbatim transmission, okay, um, this and and you have a compositional process which is like a language process, there can be variation in what you produce. Okay, um, if you have a genius the idea of poetry and that there was one text and that got corrupted that's the way they think of it that these so-called variants are just people misreading it or people trying to correct things that they didn't understand properly or 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 write things incorrectly that's the way that's the way people accounted for these things it doesn't work very well especially when you can show and, and it's possible to do this that there are places where you see You'll see, for example, two two variations in the wording of a line, and you can see that the formulaic system itself allows for two possibilities. Okay, um, I did this, for example, in studying the way in which you conclude prayers. Okay, so so there's one one way in which you can the 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 that you can do it one way, and you can do it another way, and one way works for prayers and boasts. And another way works only for prayers. So, so the variant produces the the it reflects these two different things. It's not a, a person mucking around with the text. It has to do with the way the system uh, allows for options. Okay, um, and if you understand the way the system works, then you do that. If you it, so so it, it doesn't so it's make so any nuanced, sense. So nuanced, right? Yes, exactly. So it doesn't make sense in terms of a of an error or something like that. A transmission error it makes sense in terms of an internal possibility of differenti of difference or variation within a system that's complex uh, and and therefore variable. Okay, if you think okay. about yeah. about uh, about spoken language, there are a lot of ways to say the same thing, sort of. <laughs> okay, right. Right, right, right. right. Um, that, uh, all right. Anyone else have a yeah? Does that yes. help, Janet? Great. Right. Anyone else have a comment or question? about yes, this has one. Yep. oh it's just uh, I just have a comment to know if I'm on the right track then if I understand well uh, when we have an uh, oral tradition then there's no sense in having just one single author if I understand well right right I think I think you know the I think what we're talking about is messengers and messages <laughs> instead yeah. of authors okay right uh, because the author, I think the author is a romantic idea, uh, the, the great genius individual who created something that's extraordinary, okay? And that's what we we think of Shakespeare as being that kind of an author. And I mean, Shakespeare probably would have, would, wouldn't have would have agreed himself, okay, with that notion, because he was working in a very uh, active tradition of dramatists and other things and stuff like that, right? So, mm -hmm. and taking his plots from other sources and, and working within a, a whole conventional system of dramaturgy and things like that. So, so the romanticized notion of an individual author, I think, is inappropriate to a tradition. And, and, and that, that, that's very hard to let go of, okay, for people. I mean, mm. I think that's a model for reading and for, you know, the idea that you're communicating with a, with a, a higher mind, a person of exquisite sensibility and, and expressiveness is a, a fundamental part of people's notion of what reading is like. But, mm -hmm. but I think what you need to substitute for that is what I need to do is think about what this means okay mm -hmm. and how i can best figure that out that's that that should be the purpose anyhow okay mm -hmm. not the not not what the author had in mind but what the text is trying to say to me okay, okay. Mm -hmm. and the other comment uh, well question i had it was about the uh, when when was there a, a, a change from oral tradition to a written tradition uh -huh. so, uh, when did that happen and what happened then you know yeah well uh, um, you know it's very very hard to say we don't have any evidence about these things okay um, we, we have people talking about uh, Euripides 
uh, edition of Homer or Aristotle's text and things like that. Um, and, and, but I think the, the best uh, information that I know of about this is not so much about it becoming written as about the tradition starting to narrow down in its variation, okay? Um, that's not quite the same thing, okay? And I'm, I'm a little bit wary of equating these two. But one thing that a, a, a good friend of mine, uh, a person named Stephen Lowenstam, was able to show was if you look at the vase paintings, uh, of scenes of Homeric scenes, okay, from the sixth, fifth, and fourth centuries, um, the, and, and even earlier, um, the, they most precisely reflect what we have in our Iliad and Odyssey in the fourth century representations. Okay, after that, before that, you have different names, you have different numbers of people, and different uh, ways of portraying the scenes that you know, are, 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 uh, uh, they're disturbing and confusing to somebody who knows our poem, okay? And I think what's happening is that the, the amount of variation is getting becoming narrowed. And in the fourth century, Italian vases, these are the Greek vases that were found, that were found in southern Italy, in Apulia and other places. You have things that are very close to our Iliad. Um, so what's happening is that the, that the amount of variation is getting is is getting restricted, and I think that's that. Uh, it can be either of two phenomena. Okay, the the com comparative research in places like in, in modern India shows that the more widespread a tradition becomes, the less variation it has. That's an interesting phenomenon. If it stays in a local form, then it tends to be more fluid. Okay, but when it spreads out, that's when people become more aware of their differences and try and, and, and freeze it, okay? So, so it could be a phenomenon like that. But this is also, this time period also reflects the advent of writing and it's, um, and it's becoming current. You have writing in the fifth century, but it's a relatively rare and a, a process that lots of Greeks don't even approve of, let alone engage in, okay? But, but starting in the fourth century, it becomes a much more common phenomenon. And, uh, you know, this is understanding that we don't have a printing press that any, any so-called scroll, it's not, we're not talking about books of the form that we have it, it has to be written by hand. Okay, but, but um, the, there isn't, a, so, so I think there has to be, there's something like that going on, as well as this narrowing of the tradition. Um, and, and it, but we don't want to, I don't want you to get the idea that writing kills uh, a traditional system of poetry. Um, uh, I, in, in, uh, my, my example is one that I learned when I was in China a few years ago about the way the tri Tibetan epic is transmitted. So there are people who write the Tibetan epic and there, uh, the, uh, and there are those who, who compose and perform it. The, the person who writes it just writes what he would do if he were performing. Okay. In other words, he's learned how to write, but doesn't, he just has this, the, the compositional system in his head. And that's the way what he writes down. Okay, so so it proves the case. Okay, you don't have to. It, and and there are also sophisticated cultures with writing that preserve these phenomena for gener generations and centuries. Okay, so so we don't want to think of these things as mutually exclusive phenomena. Okay, um, but but uh, somehow or other, what happens is that the poetry gets written down, and and. Uh, um, and I think it, the the model in in uh, Greg Nage's book called Homeric Questions is that it's an evolutionary process, and it happens over time. Okay, and that the text gets more and more fixed, and 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 writing is a part of that process. Okay, um, I, I should also say that that uh, I once witnessed a performance of a Persian epic, the Shahnameh, in which the performer had a scroll in his hand, and as he was performing, he kept on, ever, occasionally he'd actually look at it, but he would keep on pulling on the scroll, and at the end there was a big pile of scroll, but it was just a prop, okay? He wasn't really using the, the fact that it was written down to perform, okay? So, so, you know, in cultures in which writing is valued, in which it's bad to be illiterate, you can see a performer would want to have a have a prop of being a, of a scroll to prove that he knew he knew the tradition properly. You understand? So, uh, it's another example of the way this stuff works in, in relationship to writing. 
Okay. So that's really about managing status, right? The status of attrition, the status of performance, yes. as opposed to maybe the mechanics of it. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, I mean, this is a lot to think about. And, uh, you know, I want to see if Sarah has a question. Um, do you have anything, Sarah, you'd like to add or ask? I mean, there's no pressure if you don't. It's okay. But, um, yes. Uh, and I, I didn't see the previous session. So if you already covered this, it probably didn't. No, no, no. You can edit yeah. that bit out. Okay. Um, yes, yeah, so you, you were talking earlier about how the, the meter of the older poetry, ancient mm -hmm. Greek poetry, was comparable to, to other examples from other Indo-European languages. And yes. I wondered if that was true also of some of the themes that we're seeing in, in the Homeric epic and, and other early Greek poetry. Yes, I think I think that's true. I, I, I worked on a particular area of research in this regard. Um, so so if we the way the, the, the compositional model that Albert Lord uh, developed in this wonderful book called The Singer of Tales, which you can r read online and there'll be soon be a new print edition of it, um, is, is that you have the, the smallest level of the traditional system is the formula, the little thing like the name epithet combination, and then there are also formulaic lines, but the, but the singers also work with larger clumps of language, which he called themes, and the theme, and then there's an even larger uh, a structural unit, which is the song itself, okay? So if we think about themes, and this is a more fluid and a less, a more difficult concept to define, my example of a prayer or a, an arming scene or the description of a sacrifice or when a boat leaves, uh, you, get, you raise the sails and you leave a harbor when you come back and so forth. Um, these are these are conventional scenes that can be described in a variety of different ways and understanding one you need to understand all the others well it probably applies to all the units of the poetry if you if you really know what's going on and if you think about there being different versions of any given and different different performances of any given piece so um, if if uh, if what we're, we're, we're trying to to look at in terms of the, the the any piece of language, therefore, is anchor is anchored into something larger than itself. Okay, um, and and I think that's a that's a that's a very good powerful concept. So one of the things that's been discovered since Parry and Lord is that there are chunks of language. Well, it actually, goes back quite a ways, but there there are chunks of language in the poetic traditions of Indo-European that seem to be inherited in common. Okay, so so there. This concept of uh, that we have reflected in the form kleos afiton, uh, which has an exact cognate in Sanskrit shravas akshitam, or in my case, what I was going to talk about is the way prayers are are described and the language of prayers or language that's associated with them and um, and how they work. So, so what I tried to show in my book by looking at the Homeric formulas and then seeing that there are comparable syntag syntagmas in Vedic epic for describing prayers, for using as prayers and also boasts, is that there's a certain um, uh, 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 notion also about language and, and language as a competitive system and as an active thing. So it's the difference between just just talking and what we call speech acts, okay? So it's clear that the, the words that I was studying are speech act words, words that, and when you utter them, they, they are, they're they're very powerful things. They're like when you get married and you say, I do, that changes your social uh, uh, and legal status, okay? Um, so th those are not just any old words and they're, they have a lot of tradition as well as function to them. Um, so what I was able to show, I think, is that that this concept of language as a powerful force, which is manifested in specific contexts of heroes in battle, uh, of people speaking to divinities, and in a legal context uh, as well, goes back to a, a, a tradition that was held in common. Uh, it's it's a little more a little more subtle and nuanced than the notion that the actual themes. Uh, in all their glory and epic themselves go go back to a common source, but I could see that there might be cases where we could discover such things as well. Okay? Lenny, can I ask just one final question? So, um, so I think 
sort of where this leaves us as readers at the moment, as we're kind of thinking through these ideas, is yep. that um, diction, these uh -huh. words, use in context, are really the best expression of theme, right? And that's something that, that's right. that you've written about. That's something that Greg has written about. So let's say you're, um, you're a fledgling reader and you, you've read the Iliad maybe once, or maybe you're just, you know, you've just started reading or maybe you're approaching it for the second or third time. I mean, what is the strategy for trying to immerse ourselves in that? I mean, is it reading it over and over again? And then, you know, you talk about understanding how these different scenes develop, how these themes develop. Do we sit down and say, well, I'm interested in X, Y, Z. I'm going to look at every example I can find. I mean, what can we do if we're not experts in ancient Greek? Right. I, I think that's the that's the that's the best policy. If you if you know, if you can do it, you don't necessarily have to look at every one, but a, a selection of them will give you an idea of what are the different possibilities that a poet could apply, a performer could apply in a given situation, and then you can see what the choices are that are being made in any individual one. I think that's a good way of thinking of it. That when you start to understand the different ways in which a theme can be deployed, they're like options in any given instance. And what you choose to do to include and leave out or to change and develop, those are expressive things. And when you start to understand the way the system works, then you got get to underneath the surface. So this is Albert Lord said that every element in the in the traditional poetic system has depth. And, and resonance, okay? It's like uh, the harmonics of a chord on an organ, okay? So uh, if you, 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 you want to try and develop your understanding of the resonance that a, that a standard member of the audience would bring because they've been listening to this stuff for a long time and they know all the different versions, whether consciously or not, okay? So things will, 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 will uh, appear to them and whether they're conscious or not, um, and will be expressive to them that you'll miss on the first shot. Yep. All right, okay. Lenny. So, so this is super helpful. Thank you for helping us think about this. I mean, I know this is really just the beginning of this conversation, but yep. I, you know, you've inspired me to want to pick up the books um, and keep reading. So I hope other people feel inspired too. Me too. Um, I hope so. <laughs> yeah. And um, then, you know, we can continue to talk about it together. You know, community members might have differing opinions about these things. That's great. I think everyone welcomes differing uh, differing opinions about sure, all this. Exactly. I mean, as you said in the beginning, exactly. it's a dialogue, and um, you yep. know what we could do is keep reading together and see what we come up. You know, right. see see what we see. Yeah, one thing that I didn't talk about is that the where the notion of Homer comes from. Okay. Oh, okay, yeah. But, but maybe just a quick word about that. That 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 the way you know that the Greeks invented this idea of Homer as the as the poet who overarches the tradition, and we see this in other. In other places where you have a traditional system, they tend to focus a lot on one particular person. That person doesn't necessarily have to be a real person, and um, and one can show, and, uh, and it's Greg who's done this. That, for example, the name Homeros means fitting together, fitting things together, and it's a variation on uh, a piece of of uh, dic Homeric diction that's used for the process of poetic creation. And we even have a verb Homerewo that's used by Hesiod to describe the activity of the muses, okay? So, so it seems like the poetry creates Homer rather than the other way around. I think that's a cool way of thinking about it. But, yeah, yeah, but Homer yeah. didn't come from nowhere, and the need to have a kind of figurehead presiding over a tradition is something that we can understand, okay? But, and I okay. think that's something that, uh, I don't know that any, and no one's disputing that, right? Like Greg yes. says, there's a historical fact that the ancient Greeks right. So, thought of th thought of Homer as the author. Yes, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Okay. Right. Okay. Super helpful, um, Lenny. I really appreciate that uh, that extra clarification. And so I welcome our community members to help us think about these um, these topics and more uh, yeah. in the coming weeks. So okay. thanks so much, and, and until next time, everyone. Okay. Great. Thank you very much. Bye. Thanks for the great questions too.